which ultimately ensures the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So if necessary, let us pray. <clears throat> and Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day in praise and worship and in glorification of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us and our families, also for our church. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us and provided for us, and we ask that you continue to pour those blessings out onto us this evening and into our day tomorrow so that we can continue to walk in your plan, glorifying you in all that we do. And Father, we thank you for our great nation, especially our military, our policemen and firemen that stand on guard on our behalf around the world and here within our borders. We thank you for all of their service and their protection, for our freedoms and for our rights, and we ask that you allow them all to carry out their duties unto you and carry them out efficiently, and especially those in the military, be successful in all their endeavors. And we pray for those who have uh, lost their lives in military service, especially the two men in Afghanistan who lost their lives today. We just pray for their families, and we ask that you bring healing and comfort into their lives, and give them strength by your word and by your spirit. And we thank you, Father, for their service and for their sacrifice. And we also pray for all those who have been wounded, either physically or spiritually, and we ask that healing come into their lives also by your Spirit and by your word and the power and the strength of your word come into their souls personally. And Father, we pray for our local firemen and policemen. We ask that you be with them and lead them in all their endeavors according to your will. We pray for our president and ask that you continue to protect him and his family and guide and lead him in all his decision-making authority for our nation to honor your word and your divine establishment principles at minimum. And also that uh, you be with the upcoming election, Father, and lead our nation to elect that person that is closest to honoring your divine establishment principles and close to honoring your word and freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and all the other freedoms that we have that are, are our constitutional rights. And Father, we just ask that you allow us to elect that man or woman, whoever that might be, Father, to your glory. So, Father, we thank you for our time being gathered here this evening. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise, and then in concentration of your word, in Christ's precious name, amen. And Terry, if you'd like to come forward, please. <clears throat> if you all want to rise for our doxology. <clears throat> he is Lord. He is Lord, he has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He has risen from the dead, and He's my Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you very much. And please be seated. All right, thank you very much for the doxology. Now let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. 
As we continue to understand walking in the worthiness by which we have been called, we are understanding how to walk in the righteousness of God as we're in the second half of the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. And in, that, in this we have our section in verses 20 through 24 where we're talking about the new man, the new regenerated man, the new spiritual species as we also call it, that we have been made in Christ Jesus. So that has led us to understand the doctrine of the new creation, the new spiritual species. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20. And it says, But you did not learn Christ in this way, again in sin and immorality, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Christ. And these people were taught Him, they did hear Him and hear about Him. They heard through the eye gate, the ear gate. Paul taught them when he was there, and they were continuing to be taught about the truth of Jesus Christ. It says, That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, again, the old man, the old nature, which is being corrupted, in accordance with the lusts of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So tonight we're going to continue on in understanding the new man or the new spiritual species, as we call it, that we are to pick up and put on. And by doing that, we lay aside the old self, the old sin nature, that old corrupt Adamic nature that leads us into sin, human good and evil. We ought to put that aside, but we can only do that when we live in the new man that we have been created in, live in the new spiritual species by which we have been created. And when we do that, ultimately, we are filling up our soul with the Word of God, Bible doctrine, so that we're pushing out the garbage of Satan's cosmic system and getting in the absolute holiness and righteousness of God. So when we understand this doctrine, again by way of definition, the born-again believer at the moment of their salvation is made a new creature, a new creation, which we call that new spiritual species. And the two main verses for that are 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. But our pastor Passages in Ephesians chapter 2, 10, 15, and then now in chapter 4, verse 24, also give us this understanding of the new man that we have been created in. Now, well, let me give you this passage, and I'll give you this next point, is that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have passed. Come. So this is the new nature that we are living in, the regenerated human spirit with the imputation of God's absolute perfect righteousness from the moment of our salvation, and ultimately we've been created into a new creature, a new spiritual creature, and we call that the new spiritual species. Now, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I've given to this to you in a point directly and specifically, but Again, I've alluded to it, but just so you understand and it's clear within your thought process, is that, yes, every individual believer, once they become a believer, they become a new creature, a new creation, and they have a new man. But we also see throughout Scripture, when we talk about that new man, we're talking about the collective body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or we would say the church as well. So there's kind of two ways to look at this. And as you know, as we studied in the book of Ephesians thus far about the body of Christ, there is one body, but what is it? It's made up of many members, okay? So again, the new creature, the new spiritual species is ultimately one body, and we will be one entity going forward in the eternal state as the body of Jesus Christ, as that new spiritual species that was brought in to the human race for this church age. We will go forward as that, but ultimately, it begins with each individual believer once they believe in Jesus Christ and have the regeneration of their human spirit. In other words, being born again, being created a new human spirit so that ultimately they can live the spiritual life and understand the spiritual phenomenon that is God and His Word. All right, so just wanted to get that understanding in. And so we left off on Tuesday night understanding the creation of the new spiritual species. And again, in the human history or in the history of humanity, there have only been two new species that have been brought in to mankind. And as I talked to you before about Adam, we all are descendants of Adam. 
In addition, we're all descendants of Noah, but then Noah had what? Three sons, and those three sons after the flood were the ones who began populating or repopulating the world at that point in time. And so we have different nations and tribes and, and, and peoples that we call races in our day and age that come from the three sons of Noah, but ultimately from those three... Uh, three sons, they all were considered Gentiles. And then when, uh, when God brought Abraham onto the scene and then ultimately regenerated his sexual ability, ultimately he brought forward a new people, a new racial species called Israel, the Jews, Hebrews, however you like to say that, but ultimately brought forward a new racial species into humanity. And through Abraham, his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel began, and now we have a new racial species called the people of Israel. But now when the church age began, God started another species in the human race called the church, or believers in the body of Jesus Christ. So ultimately the church began a new species, but this is not a racial species, it is a spiritual species. And what's important about that is that no longer are there racial distinctions between Jew and Gentile in regard to God's plan for mankind. Now there is just one body, Jew or Gentile, one new creation, one new spiritual species. Anyone who believes in Christ is part of that and ultimately goes forward in God's plan. So we understand from this that the new spiritual species, and that's my acronym, NSS, again, the new spiritual species originated from regeneration at the moment of our salvation when we believed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And this is part of the mechanics of the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. And again, the baptism of Holy Spirit, sometimes we identify that with the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, but the indwelling and baptism of the Holy Spirit are... Even though they are linked together, they're kind of two separate things. The indwelling of God the Holy Spirit is His residence inside of you. The baptism of God the Holy Spirit is then His work to identify you with the body or the person of Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit's baptism that places you in union with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And now you are one with Christ. So even though the baptism of the Holy Spirit can include the indwelling, indwelling has its purpose of, again, His residence inside of us for empowerment and enablement, but the baptism is part of His ministry of indwelling when ultimately He then identifies us with the person and work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. So we are identified with the work of Jesus Christ on the cross through the baptism of God the Holy Spirit, and when we are identified with that, then we are also entered into this new spiritual species and receive that new human spirit, have regeneration in the spiritual life, and now we go forward in the plan of God. And what is also important about the regenerations of the species is that they both originated from a death. Abraham was sexually dead. He could no longer uh, procreate. Neither could his wife Sarah. She was 90. He was 99 years old, well beyond the age of childbearing in both cases. But God worked a miracle in Abraham's life, had him circumcise himself as a sign and picture of God's miracle, regenerated his sexual uh, 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 ability to procreate, and ultimately from that, the regeneration of his sexual ability brought forward a new race and a new species. Ultimately, through Abraham's sexual death, it brought forward a new racial species. And that's Romans chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Also in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 through 12. And the same goes for the church. And it's because of the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our identification with His death in the payment of the penalty of our sins, ultimately we have new life. We have a new man. We are uh, created a new spiritual species. We are a new species in mankind. But we could also say not only his death, but also his resurrection. Because as Abraham had sexual death, he had to be given new sexual life in order to bring forward that racial species. As Jesus Christ died physically upon that cross, first dying spiritually for our sins and then physically, 
As you know, he was raised on the third day, and now he is the prototype for the resurrection for the church and ultimately is the head of its body. So again, a death brought about both species, the Jews and also what we would call the church or the body of Christ. And for the church, it's our identification and union with the substitutionary spiritual death of Jesus Christ on the cross that then is demonstrated in the new life that we have with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as a result of the new spiritual species, distinction between Jew and Gentile is removed. And we noted this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. There's no more Jew, there's no more Gentile, there is just one body in Christ. And as we also read in those passages, again, Christ came and broke down the dividing barrier, the dividing wall that separated the Jew from the Gentile. And so when we talk about that dividing barrier, we say, yes, he came to break down the wall of sin, but ultimately he also came to break down the wall of what? Religion and prejudice in humanity. And he broke those walls down through his death upon the cross by, again, paying for the sins of the entire world and giving everybody the same privilege and opportunity to be entered into the family of God. So as Jesus Christ broke down the wall of sin, he broke down the wall of prejudice and uh, false religion and man-made walls and pillars that are put up to separate individuals. Well, because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, those walls have been torn down. There's no more Jew and Gentile. There's just one in the body of Jesus Christ when we, uh, for the church age. When we get into the tribulation and then go forward into the millennial reign, ultimately we'll be doing it from a spiritual position in resurrection body from heaven. But when we see these things going on, remember the tribulation is the last seven years of the age of Israel. So God is going to work through Israel once again as the client nation with 144,000 Jews that are anointed and uh, with the Holy Spirit. Again, not everybody's going to be indwelt with the Spirit like we are in the church age. But those 144,000 Jews are going to be indwelt and anointed. Uh, Revelation chapter 6 tells you about that. And they are going to be the witnesses to the world during that point in time. Then when we get into the millennial reign, ultimately God is going to establish Israel and Jerusalem as the, as the kingdom of God. And all the nations are going to have to come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was reading a little bit about this today, but again, on the Feast of Tabernacles, every year they're going to have to come up uh, to Israel and pay homage to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they're going to have to go physically to Jerusalem, almost like that pilgrimage once again going to that place. And it says that if they do not do that during the millennial reign, ultimately those nations will be under discipline because they didn't pay honor to the Lord. <clears throat> so, in any case, there is no, for the church age, Jew or Gentile, inside the spiritual species, the new spiritual species, called the church, the body of Christ, the new man, ultimately there is no differences. And that's why we also see in Scripture there's no male or female, you know, no Jew or Gentile, no uh, Scythian or, or uh, Roman or whatever other kind of nationality you want to have. Again, there aren't any of these dividing barriers. We are all one in Christ. And what does that mean? That in society, and humanity, we're all equal? Absolutely not. Ultimately, you know, there's a difference between the husband and wife, and there's authority between men and women, or the male and female in the husband and wife. But what does it mean in the spiritual life is that we all have the same privilege and opportunity to go forward and excel in the spiritual life. We all have the same opportunity to glorify God. We all have the same opportunity to utilize our spiritual gift, learn the Word of God, apply it, and then ultimately fulfill God's will and plan for our lives. The male doesn't have it over the female. The Jew doesn't have it over the Gentile or vice versa. Anyone who believes has the same privilege and opportunity to execute the unique spiritual life for the church age to maximum glorification of God. And so as we only see in uh, Scripture, the only distinction during our church age is between believer and unbeliever. That's the only distinctions that we have in regard to the spiritual life. Everything else is equal privilege and equal opportunity 
because we are all one in the body of Christ. So the reason then for the new spiritual species is the perpetuation of the great power experiment that began in the hypostatic union. When Jesus Christ came as the God-man, we call that the hypostatic union, where he was 100% God and 100% man at the same time, without losing any attribute of humanity or deity. He did not give up his deity to become humanity. He always had his deity. And even as a little baby, when he's in the manger and he couldn't feed himself in his humanity, ultimately his deity could not serve him to feed him at that point in time, but yet his deity was was what? Keeping the stellar universe in play because he controls the heavens. He controls the history of mankind. He controls the heavens and the universe and keeps everything in play. And I love, uh, uh, just a little side note here, and I, I, I brought, look at it, Rob reminded me of this. He's just kind of chuckling over there. He probably doesn't know what I'm going to say. But ultimately talking about gravity, okay? Man cannot figure out what gravity is. You know, there's a lot of things we can figure out about our earth and about science and all this. They cannot figure out what gravity is. And gravity is nothing more than the power of God, Jesus Christ, keeping us on planet earth. And again, you ever think of anything that, you know, you take an object and you spin it and you spin it, what happens? Everything flies off. It doesn't come together. But yet we have gravity in the earth that spins and is spinning in the universe, solar universe, and nothing, and shouldn't everything be flying off? You would think. But then they'll say, well, that's because of gravity. But anyway, because, but because of God's power, he keeps us intact. He pulls us down. He draws us in. So again, you know, they cannot figure out what gravity is. I don't know if they'll ever figure it out, even if we are here for another thousand years. But we know what it is. It's the power of God. It's the power of Jesus Christ holding the universe together. So in any case, when Jesus Christ came in his first advent, in hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% man, union, again, without losing attributes of either, ultimately, God worked through Jesus Christ in, so, to help him and empower him and enable him. Jesus Christ did not use his own deified powers to solve his own problems. Sometimes he would use his deified powers for, to perform miracles, but that too was through the, uh, the ministry and direction of the Holy Spirit. But ultimately, he did not use them to solve his own problems. So if he was that little baby in the manger, even though he was God, the creator of the heavens and earth and every morsel of bread, ultimately he could not feed himself bread. He had to be fed by his parents and ultimately by his mother for the first you know, several months anyway. But yet he was still keeping the stellar universe in play. So when he was here during his first advent, he relied not on his own deified power, but on the power of God. The power of the Word of God, the power of the filling and ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And with those two power options working within his soul, he executed God's plan to the fullest. And in that plan, during that first advent, remember, he began as absolute holiness and righteousness. He began without sin. He was born of the Virgin Mary, so he did not have a human father. Therefore, he did not have an old sin nature. Therefore, he did not have imputed to him Adam's original sin, because there was no place to hold it. Unlike us, we're born with a sin nature. We have a place, a home, to receive Adam's original sin. And we do when we die spiritually, when we come forward from the womb, as we say. Or we just don't become spiritually alive. It's probably a better way to say that. But in any case, Jesus Christ, when he was born physically, he absolutely was spiritually alive because he did not have a sin nature, nor was God able to impute to him Adam's original sin. So he was born without sin. He was born impeccable. And ultimately, he remained without sin. He remained impeccable all the way to the cross. So that ultimately when he got to the cross, he was the lamb without blemish, the lamb without spot, had no sin of his own, and could be sacrificed for our sins, could receive our sins and pay for them because he did not have to pay for his own. So ultimately, through the power of the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, those two power options were working in his life, and he was able to overcome the temptations of life the temptations of Satan and his cosmic system, and never sin. 
That's the power of God. And now you and I have been created a new spiritual species. And we too have that same power. The power that was first given to the Lord Jesus Christ in His first advent is the same power that you and I now have. For Jesus, we call it the prototype or the experimental power system. But for us, it's no longer an experiment. It is actually now being utilized in full force. He demonstrated what that power is all about to remain without sin, now we can utilize that power in our life when we take in the Word, stay filled with the Holy Spirit, so that ultimately we too are resistant to sin, or even impervi- impervient, imper- in, 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 impervious, that's it, impervious to sin. In other words, we cannot, you know, we can uh, absolutely function and operate without sinning. Okay. Now, we don't just not sin because we're saved. No, that doesn't do it. Just because you're regenerated and born again doesn't mean you will never sin again. You have to take the power that Jesus Christ had and utilize it within your life so that you too can function and operate in holiness and righteousness and operate without sin. So we have been given this power so that, again, we perpetuate the Uh, the prototype spiritual life of Jesus Christ, now into the church age. And in order to do that, we needed to be regenerated. We needed to be made a new spiritual species. We needed to have this new man and new creation given to us or made inside of us so that we could function and operate in that power, the power of the Word, the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And remember, up until Jesus Christ, no other person in human history had the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now every church age believer has the permanent indwelling, and then that coupled with the ability to learn the Word of God. So ultimately, we complement our Lord's strategic victory upon the cross, where He was impeccable. He went forward in the divine power that God had given to Him, what I call God's power system, or GPS. Ultimately, now that GPS has been given to us, and we complement His strategic victory Victory with tactical victories in our lives. And when we have those tactical victories, it means we utilize God's power system that is found inside what we call also the portfolio of invisible assets. And I've given you that before, and ultimately there are many assets that God has given the church age believer that's part of that portfolio, and one of them is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, being a new spiritual species, the Word of God, the filling of uh, God the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of all three members of the Trinity, uh, your uh, spiritual gift, your ability to learn the Word of God, all those things are part of the portfolio of invisible assets. And when we utilize that portfolio in our new man, ultimately our life will be a tactical victory for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to complement His strategic victory upon the cross. Now, again, let's talk a little bit about tactical victories because every day you can win tactical victories when you stay resistant to sinning and you say no to the temptations of sin and ultimately continue to walk in righteousness. But the completion of a tactical victory is the totality of your life. And in the totality of your life, if you kept going forward and grew to spiritual adulthood and became a a witness for God in the appeal trial of Satan in the angelic conflict, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in just a minute, if you are a winner believer, as we call it, and an overcomer, ultimately your life was a tactical victory inside the angelic conflict. And that complements Jesus Christ's strategic victory where He went to the cross paid for our sins, fulfilled the plan of God the Father, and then was resurrected to eternal glory. So again, being a new creation gives us the opportunity and ability to do those things and to perform in those things uh, without problem or without issue, without handicap whatsoever. But the issue is, is that it's all about your volition. You have a choice. You have a choice to go forward in that fantastic opportunity that God has given to you and exploit that to your spiritual life and your advantage in the spiritual realm to God's glory, or you can choose not to. 
You can choose to live in the world. You can choose to be lazy about your spiritual intake, about your application of Bible doctrine, about your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can choose to be lazy. In other words, ignore those things. Again, not even being malicious, just not bothering. You can choose to do that. Or you can choose to take the fantastic opportunities that God has given to us because remember, this is unique to the church age, to church age believers. No other believers had the opportunity and power to glorify God the way you do. They didn't have what is called the new creation. They weren't made a new man as we are called that new man inside the church. They didn't have that opportunity. They weren't part of the body of Jesus Christ. You and I are. We have fantastic opportunity with fantastic uh, power available to us. We have all the potential in the world. Now it's just up to us to make a decision to go forward in that potential and go forward in God's plan. Make good decisions each and every day and build and develop that relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and apply His Word consistently within your life. And as you know, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it's all about renewing your mind. And as that says in the passage, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And really, when we talk about the good, acceptable, and perfect, we talk about the three stages of spiritual adulthood that we can grow towards, or the three stages of divine good production, fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Again, either way you want to slice it, again, it's in view. We have opportunity to go forward in the plan of God and excel with the uniqueness that God has given to us, but we have to renew our thought process. We have to renew our mind by taking in the Word of God. Positionally, we stand renewed as members of the body of Jesus Christ, but we didn't just learn the Word of God overnight. But we have to now take it in and learn it and then get the garbage of this life out of our soul and get the righteousness of God into our soul so that we have divine viewpoint when we look at life's situation and not have human viewpoint when we look at life's situations. And again, <clears throat> you know, there's all kinds of things within your life that, you know, you have a little choice to make each and every day. And, uh, you know, uh, just the uh, Quick little, you know, silly example is I went out to dinner last night, had a great time, enjoyed the meal. But, you know, to me, I could go out and have a great five-star meal at a five-star restaurant and have filet mignon and be very happy and enjoy the meal. Or I could go to McDonald's and be just as happy, okay? It doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter. These things do not matter. Again, thank God for the food that He gave you. If you can enjoy one, you can enjoy the other. Ultimately, it doesn't matter, whether you have five-star restaurants or not, whether you have filet mignon or not, those things do not matter. What matters is the mentality of your soul and your divine viewpoint. Are you looking at things in, in, uh, through God's eyes or are you looking at things through the world, or we would say Satan's eyes and the lusts of this world? And remember, we just learned about the lusts of deceit and again, how lust deceives us each and every day. So if we lust, lust, lust after anything in this life, it could be, you know, a new bike for a child. If they lust after the new bike, again, they're going to be led in a negative direction. They're going to be deceived thinking that's going to bring them happiness. And it may for about two seconds, but the first time they fall off that bike, the happiness is going to be gone, okay? So in any case... Again, renewed in our thinking. Let's be thinking in, in, in God's terms. Let's be thinking of the blessings of the eternal state, of the glorification of God, of the new Jerusalem that is given to us. Again, streets paved with gold, the uh, uh, power and authority we could have to judge nations or judge angels in the eternal state, to be the wife of Jesus Christ for all of eternity and at His side, in everything that he does for the rest of ever. For the rest of ever? For the rest of eternity. Again, let's look at things from that perspective and not get so sidetracked by the things of this world. But if we're conformed by this world, we're not going to have good, acceptable, and perfect. We're not going to have the newness of life. Even though the new nature is in us, it's going to be dormant, and we're not going to be able to truly experience it and have fun with it, have a great time with it, and have a fantastic impact during our walk here on planet Earth. 
So we have the same divine power available to us that Jesus had, yet we are imperfect. We have a sin nature. So again, because of our imperfection, because of our sin nature, we needed this extra power in this intensified stage of the angelic conflict. And ultimately, we have been given that power so that we can excel and go forward in a fantastic way. And it's interesting when you think about a little bit, you know, the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. And we talk about the devil and Satan. And what we think when we talk about the devil and Satan is just evil and wickedness and rottenness coming down and hitting us over the head each and every day. And yeah, it's out there, okay? That stuff is out there. I get it. But this intensified stage of the angelic conflict, just look at how we've changed as a people over the last 100 years, especially with technology. Again, we went 6,000 years and things were always the same, horse and buggy. You know, we invented the wheel and that was about it, okay? Although they did build the pyramids, that was pretty good, but they did it with horse and buggy, okay? But now we have technology and computers and now we have televisions and radios and movies and all these other things. Now what is happening in a very subtle way is the distraction of the mentality of our souls. And that is the greatest tool that Satan has ever came up with, to distract the mentality of our soul. And he's been doing it for years in various ways and various means. And again, they had plays and, you know, orators back in the day, and they had all kinds of deception from that aspect as well, and the pagan religions as well, and their communication. But again, to get it in every person's living room and every house, and to be with you 24 by 7, and you look at the kids around today, they've got something in their ear, 24 by 7, that they're listening to some garbage of Satan's cosmic system. When do we have time for divine viewpoint? When do we have time for the renewing of our mind? Again, we are in the intensified stage of the angelic conflict, and the intensification is very subtle, where again, we're being lulled to sleep through technology and things that benefit us and make life easier and you know, make life more joyful, you know, supposedly. But ultimately, all the while, our minds are being drawn away. Our thought process is being taken away from our Lord and Savior, our God and our Creator. So again, that's why we have the importance of this new nature that has been given to us with the power that's available to us like never before because in actuality there's more for us to overcome in the mentality of our soul than any believers, I believe, throughout the history of the human race. When you think about it, again... How many people throughout the rest of the history of the human race had stuff in their face, 24 by 7, telling them how to live? No, nothing. You know, they'd be farmers, they'd be out in the field, and they'd be looking at nature and looking up at the sky at night and thinking about God and their creator and their creation. And they'd be thinking about those things and have quiet time, personal time of reflection. Who am I? How would I get created? Why am I here? All those things of reflection. Again, Satan doesn't want us to ask those questions. He just wants our mind to be filled with thoughts, and thoughts and thoughts and thoughts that he puts in our direction. So, again, intensified stage of the angelic conflict, not that we're seeing, although we do see it in addition to it, but we do see the corruption and the evil and the immorality. But the reason that there's corruption, evil, and immorality more and more in a society is because our minds have been overtaken more and more in society, and we've drifted away from the thought process of divine viewpoint, given the divine power that we have available to us, and instead we've gone the way of the world. So the purpose of the new spiritual species ultimately is to remove all the past actions of miracles too that also led believers and believers leaned upon. And remember how Jesus Christ said, you know, the Jews look for a sign. You know, the Greeks seek for knowledge, but the Jews look for a sign. You know, the Jews in the ancient world, they always looked for miracle, miracle, miracle. Even the pagan gods that they used to worship, they're always looking for signs from the gods. Ooh, there's a blood moon. The god is angry at us. Ooh, there's an eclipse. Ooh, we must have done something wrong. Let's give offerings. Oh, the, you know, it didn't rain. Something must be going on with the god of the heavens or, you know, the god of water or whatever the case may be. They were always looking for signs. And they would actually, you know, look at the entrails of animals and try to read, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, soothsayer signs from the entrails of animals when they would cut them open. 
But again, they were always looking for signs. They were looking for miracles. And the fact of the matter is, for God to do a miracle is like the easiest thing he could absolutely do. I mean, when Jesus was like, you know, who should we pay taxes to? He said, "Uh, go down to the water and pick up the fish that's laying there on the side. And a guy goes down, picks up the fish. He goes, now open the mouth. You know, oh, what's in there? Oh, it's a coin. Oh, how'd that get there? Okay, a coin in a fish's mouth, okay? And then he says, whose picture is on the coin? He says, Caesar. Well, render to Caesar what is Caesar. Render to God what is God. Give the coin to Caesar. Pay your taxes as you should. That's a divine, righteous thing to do. But ultimately, you know, render unto God what is God. What is that? The new creature, the new creation, the new spiritual species that we have been made with the divine power that he has made available to us. Render that to God. So to affect history through the born-again believer is a system far, far better and greater than any miracle could ever perform. So ultimately, you know, it's a lot harder for God to affect human history through born-again believers who are positive towards His Word, who learn the Word of God through their own positive volition, through the strength of the Holy Spirit, but through their positive volition in faith, and then have them go out and do stuff. It's harder for him to get people to do those things than for him to create a miracle. Again, it's a lot easier for him to make a flood and just destroy all the evil people in the world than it is for a generation of positive believers to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ, bring salvation to a world, and change the evil world into a righteous world. It's a lot harder to do that. But yet God did it. I was talking with somebody the other day, I think Tuesday night. You know, just think about Jesus Christ, one person who was here for a few years, and then 12 disciples that went out and turned out the whole world, turned the world upside down. And they even, over time, changed a pagan religion government called the Roman Empire into a Christian government called Christianity. Okay? and ultimately changed the world, turned it upside down, and now the whole world has the opportunity for Christ. And how did he do it? By enacting some huge miracle? Well, the only miracle that he did was give us the Holy Spirit, regenerate us in our soul and give us the Spirit, which are all what? Invisible things, things that man cannot see. He didn't do it through visible miracles. He did it through individuals operating through the invisible spirit with the invisible word in their soul to have strength and power and then share that in service to other people. Again, change the world over. He did, and he did it a harder way and in a much more miraculous way than any miracle he could ever perform. And that's why, again, when we get to heaven... And we sit back and we look at human history from, you know, God's perspective and we see the miracles of the Old Testament. And then we're going to see our age and the church age. And, you know, when he raised up positive believers and they had uh, impact on, you know, uh, societies and governments and toppled evil and wickedness in this world and used those individuals through what their word and their invisible assets that they had. And again, the world didn't know about these people or prop them up, but yet they changed the world. Again, when we sit back and see that from heaven, our jaw is going to drop And Wow, isn't that a great thing? And all those miracles of the flood and the pillar by fire and the pillar by night, uh, or cloud by day and fire by night, or vice versa, sorry. But in any case, all those other miracles that God had and did, we're going to say, oh, that was cool, but look at what he did with the church. Look at what he did with the body of Jesus Christ. Absolutely fantastic. So, again, in order to pull that off, as we could say in a slang way, he needed to create a new spiritual species. He needed to create uh, us as regenerated individuals and then empower and strengthen us so that we could go forward doing that. But again, his empowerment and strength is given to us positionally, but then we need to pick it up and put it on experientially through our own positive volition. And if you ever reach spiritual adulthood, if you're there now, great. Uh, If you're not, keep going. But again, when you reach spiritual adulthood, your impact on history is going to be tremendous. You're not going to believe the impact that you had. And again, as I said, you know, when we had our 15-year anniversary, uh, was it last week, two weeks ago? When we had that celebration, we talked about one individual 
who came and witnessed to my mother and then ultimately my father becoming a true believer, even though they were churchgoers prior to that, and then affecting my family and then ultimately you know, uh, us reaching out and creating and starting a church where now hundreds of people have come through the doors and listened through the internet and ultimately have been impacted by one person, one little old lady, you know, way back when, okay? Again, the impact to change people and societies. And again, if you let time run enough, that impact can expand further and further and further. And from the one that, you know, that we talk about there and her expansion and the impact that she's had in history and just this little geographic location, then you take every one of those people called you and then see how you are a one and now you go out and impact other people within your life and the spread that that can happen, that, that that can have and the positive impact you will have on your nation and on your society. So again, it's a very great you know, impact that we have. And for the believer that grows to spiritual adulthood and has a life that is a tactical victory inside the angelic conflict, they are going to be part of what we call the historical record section in God's throne room, as Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, calls this one of the blessings for the overcomer uh, during the church. And ultimately, the overcomer will be, as it says in that passage, a pillar in God's throne room. And you say, well, a pillar, what does that mean? I'm just going to stand there all day and be like this? No, 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 okay? You have to go back to ancient times, and in ancient times, they would write their history on pillars inside their castles or their temples or whatever the case may be, and whatever writing they would have, whether it be hieroglyphics or whatever, they would document their history, and it would be a pillar in that building. And anybody could go in and read about that history of the ancient days. That will be the life of the believer who wins a tactical victory because they've grown to spiritual adulthood and had impact here in this time. And oh, by the way, the other aspect of this is that in that historical record section will be the life of the positive believers and the impact that they have. What will be blotted out? Man's work. Man's work will be, and man's history, absolutely blotted out. We'll see history from God's perspective and, you know, the believers throughout the human race who have had tremendous impact, but everything else in, in regard to human history, blotted out. It'll be forgotten, and we won't even think about it. We won't even care about it because, again, of the righteousness and holiness of God and us versus the sin nature that created the rest of human history. So we note that because of this power provision that God has given to us, we have a unique opportunity also to suffer for blessing. Again, suffering for blessing is a major aspect of the spiritual life, to suffer in somehow, some way for God, just as Jesus Christ had suffering throughout His ministry and then ultimately at the cross. The positive believer also can have suffering throughout their life based on what God would put before them. And we can do that in three categories as we have up the acronyms on the board. And these three categories also align with the three stages of spiritual adulthood, spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, and then spiritual maturity. But the three categories of suffering that we call is providential preventative suffering, where you go through some tragedies to, so that you don't become arrogant within your soul and you continue to go forward in the plan of God. Then there's other suffering as we grow that gives us momentum. And we say, hey, I accomplished that thing. Now I can do greater things. I'm going to go forward in the plan of God. And you get motivated to go forward even further. And then as you continue to go forward, we have that third category that we call evidence testing, where we become a, a star witness on the prosecution, uh, or for the prosecution on the trial stand of the angelic conflict. Again, the appeal trial of Satan and the fallen angels. We could be, go through evidence testing as Jesus absolutely did, Paul did, Moses did, many other believers, Job did, many other believers uh, throughout history have gone through evidence testing and we become a star witness, not just a witness, but a star witness for the prosecution of the appeal trial of Satan and the fallen angels. So again, the fact that we have been made into a new spiritual creature and we are part of that new spiritual man called the body of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to go through this suffering for blessing where we go through those things with God, not 
with fear and worry and anxiety. That doesn't bless anybody or bless anything. It doesn't glorify God. It's just your emotions taking over. It's when you can go through tragedy with inner peace and happiness and calm and not be freaking out over the littlest things that happen. Ultimately, when you go through that, suffering for blessing, you are a winner believer, you are an overcomer, and you will be a witness for the prosecution in a fantastic way. So again, we should embrace suffering when we endure it. And, you know, it's not going to be your whole life. It's going to be parts of your life. As Job was that great example and witness, he had everything. It was all taken away. But then he went through the suffering. He got everything back double. He got twice as much as he had before, both in time and in the eternal state. So, again, it's a period of time where we go through that suffering. And we, what do we do? Do we freak out? Do we give up? Do we fear, worry, anxiety? No, we continue to go forward in courage and go through whatever God has for us with inner peace, happiness, and contentment, and more importantly, not breaking our relationship experientially with the Lord. So when we do, we will complement the strategic victory of the angelic conflict that Jesus Christ won upon the cross. We'll complement that with those tactical victories uh, called our lives. And then we will be the witness for the prosecution, who is God. Again, he's prosecuting Satan and the fallen angels in that great trial called the angelic conflict. And as you know, we are now part of the appeal trial of the angelic conflict, where Satan has appealed his sentence that he should not be thrown in the eternal lake of fire due to his rebellion against his creator. And God is saying, no, 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 you do deserve it. But he also, I'm sure, just like you and I, had an opportunity to overcome our sin, full nature. Satan and the fallen angels also had an opportunity to overcome their sinful natures by believing in the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. But they continue to reject it. But, and so God sentenced them to the eternal lake of fire. And now they've appealed that, and so God has granted them their appeal, and now human history is being laid out in that appeal trial. And human history is actually reflecting what went on in the angelic realm, in the angelic trial, in the first main trial of Satan and the fallen angels. Human history is playing that out. We've talked about that before. Don't have time to go into it in detail. I did put some detail in your notes. You can read that. But ultimately, uh, we are in the appeal trial, and we will be a witness for the prosecution, just as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was a witness for the prosecution. So when a believer is consistent in living daily inside the plan of God, placed under undeserved suffering as a witness, ultimately you too will receive the conveyance of all the blessings that God has promised for the believer. Again, the conveyance of the escrow blessings that God has set aside for you in eternity past. And remember, this is part of you know, God's you know, overall divine decrees, as we call it, but from eternity past, He gave us all the same privilege and opportunity to earn the same rewards and blessings while we're here on planet Earth. He gave us the same privilege and opportunity. He set aside a room of blessings, let's say, for each and every one of us, and whether we reap those or not is dependent upon what we do with the new creation, the new man that we have been given. So when we do, again, we will receive the escrow blessings, and that does what? Glorifies God to the maximum. And with those blessings, we will glorify Him forever and ever and ever. All right, now our final two points, and these are quick points, uh, both of them. But the result of the new spiritual species is that we have invisible historical impact. Again, the mature believer has historical, invisible impact in those three categories that we talk about. First, personal, then national, and then international. And this is what we call blessing by association. You see, when you are a a, a mature believer and God is able to bless you, other people around you in close proximity to you who are part of your business or family or friends, they too will be blessed because you are being blessed. Then we have the second stage, which is national blessing where you become part of the pivot for your nation. And because there's a small group of positive believers in a nation, the whole nation is able to be blessed by God, and everybody receives blessings that are, emanate 
from a few uh, mature believers. And then at the same point, we could also have international impact where our country will be a witness to other countries where we send out missionaries and uh, give them the Word of God in a fantastic way. We can be part of the pivot for our nation and be part of international impact where we impact other countries because of our positive volition in the wor uh, Word of God. So, Again, that is the result of the new spiritual species, having impact that is invisible, again, because, again, we're dealing with an invisible God, with the invisible Word of God, with the invisible Spirit that is working through us. And even though we physically can impact individuals, we call it an invisible impact because, again, it's all in the spiritual realm. It's in the spiritual life and in the mentality of the soul. So then we have our final point, which is the opportunity for the new spiritual species. And again, this is kind of a summary and wrapping up what we've been noting. But you and I have the greatest opportunity of any believers throughout human history, especially up until this point. Maybe the millennial believer, but again, Jesus Christ is going to be there personally ruling and running everything, you know? We're doing it in an invisible way. Jesus isn't here personally. We don't see miracles. We don't have signs and wonders. Again, the tribulation will. The millennial reign will. They're going to see all kinds of fantastic things like never before. But we are in a time of invisible spiritual impact. And this is a great opportunity that we have like no other generation. That's why we have extra blessings too in this generation. Again, uh, because, uh, and not just this generation, but the church age, I should say. And that's why we're part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the wife of Christ. We get extra blessings as a result because it's, you know, we have a, a unique time in which we live in. So again, we've got the greatest opportunity ever given to any believers, so let's utilize that. Let's utilize that potential in a very dynamic way. Let's utilize it in a fantastic way so that we do have impact within our lives. Let's not just go along with the crowd or go along with the world and just live like everybody else and have no impact at all. No, let's utilize the unique opportunity uh, with the unique uh, uh, ability to impact like never before with the unique powers and assets and resources that we have, like never before. Let's utilize those things to help other people, serve other people, and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then develop the Word of God in their soul. So ultimately, we are glorifying God to the maximum. So again, we have a privilege of being a person uh, with a purpose. Again, a purpose in our lives. And that's what we also call having a personal sense of, of destiny. That should be your life. You should have a destiny in the spiritual life for your daily walk. Not just living life and waking up and saying, oh, I don't know what's going to happen today, or I got to go to the job, or I got to do this, or I got to do that. No, you should be waking up every morning saying, God has given me resources and assets and a spiritual gift with an opportunity to use them today. How can I use them? Where will I use them? Get excited about that. Where am I going to use them? Who am I going to impact? And unfortunately, because we are in a material world, because we're material girls, and some guys here today, okay, we just think that the only impact we can have is in a material well, uh, realm. Absolutely not. The spiritual realm, that's where the impact is. That's where we need to have divine viewpoints so we see the spiritual world, the invisible uh, impact that we can absolutely have. And let's have motivation to go out there and do that each and every day. And as we do, not only will we have impact personally, nationally, and internationally, but also angelically as we will have impact in the angelic conflict as that witness on the appeal trial of Satan and the fallen angels. So again, we must entirely change our viewpoint from what it was in the old man, in the old self, to the new divine viewpoint and the new nature that God has given to us. And we can do that when we put off the old man, again, put aside the sin nature and its influences and temptations or the temptations from the outside world and put on the new man inside the new spiritual species by having the filling of the Holy Spirit, taking in the Word of God and applying it consistently within our lives. And just to remind you, and I'm sure you all know this, to accomplish anything in life, again, to accomplish anything in life, it takes 
effort. Again, there's nothing you can do in life that is effortless. Everything you do takes some effort. And the more effort you put into something, the more results you're going to get from it, the more positive results you're going to get from it. And the same goes for the spiritual life. The more effort you put into it, the more positive results you're going to get from it. But if you don't put any effort into it, again, you're not going to get anything out of it, and you're going to get the opposite. You're going to have pain, suffering, hurt, uh, evil, wickedness, uh, uh, no impact whatsoever. Again, with no effort comes no results. And that's just what life is. That's what life is all about. But when we put effort in, we have tremendous results and we can have tremendous impact. And so let me leave you with this and we'll pick it up on Sunday uh, as we uh, finish up verse 24. But when we do also, it guarantees that we will have happiness. Again, the Word of God guarantees that if we put in the effort with the positive volition to take in the Word, applying it consistently, we will have happiness happiness. No doubt. Again, I don't care what depression you have in your life, whether it be chemical or uh, physical or uh, just emotional, the Word of God will overcome it and you will have the happiness of God. And again, maybe you don't have the happiness of God in your life, but that's because you don't have the Word of God in your soul the way that you should. It guarantees that you will have happiness. It guarantees that you will have impact. And it guarantees, as we said in Ephesians, as the Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, you will have a life of blessings, the super grace life that is beyond what? Your dreams, beyond all that you can ask or even think, beyond your dreams. You'll have a life beyond gnosis, a life beyond dreams, and then a life beyond glory. It's a guarantee if you go forward inside the plan of God. All right, so I'll close there this evening. We'll pick it up talking about our walk now and the application of the new spiritual species. And again, I get some interesting things to show you in regard to the holiness and righteousness that this new nature has been created in. I'll show you that on Sunday. All right, so we'll close there tonight and close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together to worship you and to serve you. And Father, we just ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home this evening. We have a prayer for Wayne Chico and Karen Chico as well, and we ask that you continue to heal and recover them, especially Wayne. Be with him and his strengthening process and then all his surgery that's coming up in a few weeks. And uh, just allow all go to well there. But more importantly, Father, strengthen them both in their spirit, by your word, and by your Holy Spirit. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together. We ask that you lead us now in Christ's precious name. Amen.